Hi everyone, happy Thursday. Today I'm gonna to be talking to Clement from Champagne Pomery. So I will be adding him as soon as he joins. And these are some of the champagnes we are gonna be tasting today. We'll go over more of that soon, but we're gonna be drinking the Brut and the Blanc de Blanc. So thank, every, thank you everyone for joining today. It looks like um, Clement's on, so one second. Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Perfect. How are you today? Fine, fine. <laughs> I am um, I am in the pop room of Champagne Pomery. It's uh, the room dedicated to all the the little bo bottles uh, like this, uh, the pop ones. Oh, cute! Yeah. <laughs> so those are the you're the small size that you guys do. Excuse me. That's the little mini sizes that you guys make. Yeah, we we have uh, we have um, a lot of uh, different. Uh, Personalize uh, quarter uh, for each uh, customers or clients, and this is the one for the the US. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I'm really excited to to have you on and to learn more about the house. Um, yes. So I guess we can start when um, when was Champagne Pomery founded, and then some of the history of the house. So um, the Champagne Pomery was founded in 1836. Um, at the beginning, there were there were no uh, Mister or Madame Pomery. It was uh, a man called Narcisse Grenot. That's why you, when you, when you look at the bottle, you will see that it's a Pomery uh, and Grenot. You see, uh, you see here. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Narcisse Grenot was a founder uh, in 1836, but it was a very very small company in 1830, in 1856, uh, he, he made a joint venture with Mr. Pomery and, um, to, to make a, a, a big, a big company of champagne. But, uh, unfortunately, two years after in 1858, uh, Mr. Pomery died. So, uh, Madame Pomery, the widow, uh, took over and took, took the control of the company. Uh, she was only 39, uh, but uh, it's uh, the, the real beginning of the company, uh, 1858, when ma Madame Pomery takes the control of the company. Uh, after a uh, very important stage is uh, 1868, when we, she decided to build the, the estate uh, in Reims. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, downtown uh, Reims uh, at the beginning, and uh, she decided to to go outside Reims to to build a very big estate of uh, 70 hectares. Uh, now it's in the middle of Reims, of course, but at, at this time it was just outside the city. Uh, a very very big estate, uh, just on the on the hill, on the chalky hill, and with a lot of um, chalk carries. Mm -hmm. uh, and she decided to to join all the choke carries uh, with galleries, and to use uh, the choke of the digging to to fill up all the choke carry to have everything at the same uh, depth. And it was a good idea because for the storage of the bottles, uh, everything is at 10 degrees all the year because we are we are at 30 meters below earth uh, everywhere. We have uh, 18 kilometers of galleries. Uh, it's uh, it's really uh, one of the biggest uh, seller in Champagne. Yes, um, it's, a, it's a very big seller. How yeah. many bottles yeah. are, are down in that cellar? How far? How many bottles are in the cellar? How many bottles? Sorry, uh, we we can we can store uh, until thirty million bottles of oh, Champagne. Wow. <laughs> 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 a huge quantity. Yes. Um, so between 1868 and 1878, uh, she, she built the, the estate in Reims. Uh, one of the, the key, uh, keystone is, uh, 1874 so is the year she, she achieved the goal to create, uh, the, the first brut. Um, uh, yes, it's a brut royal. Um, so 
the Brut Royal is really um, the the modern vision of uh, the first brute she created in uh, 1874. Um, that was really a revolution in Champagne because uh, at this time, you know, the Champagne were uh, very sweety, uh, more than 150 grams per liter. And she she made a revolution by um, removing all the sugar in the bottle, um, but but that was very difficult. But but that's why uh, uh, it, it took a long time. And in 1874, it's the first uh, the first one to be uh, to be okay and to be a very a very successful uh, wine. Um, eh, because for for removing the sugar it it it, it needed a, a very long time because um, she had to change the way to purchase uh, grapes uh, she she purchased grapes directly in the vineyard uh, she, she took the risk of the harvest uh, instead of the wine growers so that was uh, very courageous and she she built the estate to have a, a lot of space she needed space for the barrels to increase the time of aging, and she needed space uh, for the bottles to increase the time of aging because uh, the sugar was was here to to kind of hide something, maybe too much acidity, to, to uh, not enough ripeness. So uh, she has she has to work on the on the roundness of the wine, on the finesse of the wine, and so she she needed space to to edge more the the wines. So that's why the estate is so big, and uh, that's really the, the the genius of Madame Pomery was to 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 think of this uh, estate and and to have the, um, a very ambitious goal because thirty millions of bottles of storage is um, it's huge because at this time the champagne was selling only ten millions all the regions. So oh. <laughs> yeah, that was the. That was a, a vision, really a vision. So, uh, when Madame Pomery died, she, we, uh, Pomery was selling two millions of bottles. So that was one of the, of the biggest house. And uh, so in the 20th century, uh, the, the company, uh, keep, keep growing. Uh, but as you know, uh, every family, uh, after, uh, 50, 70 years, uh, uh, different um, different part of the family uh, show uh, in seventy nine that's the year of the the the, the Polignac family the heirs of Madame Pomery decided to to sell the company so from seventy nine to two thousand two the company changed uh, three time of owner. Uh, so that, that's not the best period for the company because uh, uh, too much change in a uh, in very short period. And in 2002, uh, the family Vanken took the, the control of the company. So after the, um, the Polignac family, it's a family um, who has owned the, the company for the, the most time. So since 2002. It's uh, around 20 years ago. Uh, the family Vranken, Mr. Vranken, Paul François Vranken, and Nathalie Vranken uh, are the owners of the company. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great history. So, what, <laughs> I guess going back, what inspired her to do the brute style for those who, who may not know? Um, it's really, uh, she was. Uh, she, she was more commercial than a technician and she was very uh, attentive to the market and uh, she 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 had a, a, commer a commercial director uh, in the UK that uh, was writing to her that uh, the, the British the British wanted a drier champagne and so it's it's really for the British market she she decided to to create uh, uh, this new way of uh, drinking champagne Okay, great. So I guess, and then how long have you been um, cellar master at Champagne Pomery? So I, I am in the company since 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be, I am still the vineyard manager. And in, um, and you know, it's a long, um, a long way to, to, to reach uh, the, this position. So 
uh, uh, we, you start by joining the the panel, the testing panel, and uh, in uh, 2017, I, I took over from Thierry Gasco, the ninth seller master. Uh, you know, I'm only the tenth seller master of the of Pomery, so uh, Thierry Gasco spent 25 years as seller oh, master. Wow. The, mm -hmm. the, the Prince Alain Polignac, it's also 20, more than 20 years. So uh, yes, it's uh, not so much seller master since the creation of the of the company. No, not at all. Especially, yeah, that's over 150. Or, yeah, over 150 years or close to that, and yeah. only 10, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more than 20 years of rich time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Should we um, start uh, tasting this one? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't open mine, but uh, I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know, I opened mine before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the Brut Royal is, uh, is Clement, can you hear me? Okay, we kind of lost you there for a second. Yes, now we can. Okay, so um, the Brut Royal is uh, the iconic cuvee of the company. Uh, the blue label is um, uh, really uh, widespread in the world. Of course, it's uh, really the, the key to enter the world of Pomery. So um, the, the color is uh, linked to the royalty. It's uh, the Bleu Royal, the Bleu de France. Uh, it's really the, the signature of uh, this bottle. You can find it uh, everywhere from San Francisco to Tokyo. Um, and it's uh, very important for a, a champagne house to have a very uh, regular style. And you can have a bottle of Pomerie everywhere in the world. Every time it has to be uh, exactly the same. Um, uh, whenever you are, wherever you are. And then can you go over, um, as we're tasting it, the house style as well, for those who, who don't know what your house style is? So um, the, 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 um, the house style is really based on, on what Madame Pomery uh, uh, has, has imagined in, in the 19th century. Uh, we are still in the same uh, philosophy. Um, Finesse above all. That's, that's really the, the signature of Pomery, the choice of the grapes, uh, and a very, cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> and a very, um, uh, the, the very careful about the choice of the grapes to have, uh, to, uh, to, to have this finesse. And after, of course, it's, uh, we, we, we have, um, Uh, it's a it's a champagne uh, for the world of gastronomy. So you need a lot of complexity. You need a, a lot of maturity. So we work uh, on the aging. We work on the reserve wines to have uh, with the finesse. We have structure and complexity mm -hmm. also. Um, so this blend is a very classical blend for the champagne region because it's one third. Of each variety, you have one third of Chardonnay, one third of Pinot Noir, and one third of Meunier. Mm -hmm. um, it comes from around 40 villages, um, so it's um, it's very important for this non-vintage to have a, a lot of villages because it's a, for the the consistency of the style. You need a lot of, of you can. Uh, blend villages, you can blend varieties, you can blend years, so it's very important to have a lot of, of villages. And it's villages uh, with them, we, we have a, a strong link. Huh? We, we, are, we, we have our own vineyard, of course, but we have also uh, wine growers uh, who are selling uh, their grapes to Pomerie since 50 years, 60 years. So we have really a strong link with our wine growers. That's great. That's great to have that relationship. And uh, it's a great fact that you guys use one third of, of every grape in, in the bottle. Because I know not everyone does that for their uh, non-vintage yeah. group. 
Mm-hmm. I think it's very interesting to have, um, uh, of course, P- Pomery is very, the Chardonnay is very important for Pomery. When you, you go up in the uh, pyramid of Pomery, uh, you have more and more Chardonnay. But for the, for the non-vintage, it's interesting to have um, the Meunier because it, it, it gives you the, the roundness, uh, the gourmandise, as we say in French. Um, we, we want something very, very pleasant, very, very easy. Uh, mm-hmm. but with the finesse and the complexity of Pomeroy. That's great. So it's super smooth. And there's that night, the bubbles are really fine and delicate. Yeah. So the bubbles are very, it's very important in Pomeroy, but it's very linked to the, the aging. Uh, it's a minimum three years of aging. On these bottles, more five or seven or ten or twelve on the over cuvées, but on, on this one it's a minimum uh, three, three years of aging. We have also a time after disgorgement. Uh, it's very important uh, for us the time after disgorgement, so it's minimum three months. Uh, there, are, there are no bottles shipped before three months after disgorgement because the time after disgorgement is important to to find again the balance between uh, the sugar, the wine, and the oxygen, because when you, you do the disgorgement, you have oxygen entering the bottle, so you need time to, 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 to be back to, to the good balance. Um, so reserve wines are very important, and especially in these wines, uh, you have a minimum 30% of, uh, 30% of reserve wine, so we have... Uh, uh, a great collection of uh, reserve wine. I think the treasure, w- what is a, a great house, uh, a great champagne house is the, the capacity uh, to have a very, very important collection of reserve wine. It's like a treasure. So we have a, a winery dedicated to the reserve wines here. It's uh, uh, the oldest winery of Pomerie from the 50s. Uh, a lot of tanks, more than 300 hundred tanks um, in, uh, in in concrete. So it's not stainless steel, stainless steel <laughs> tank, but it's uh, con- tight concrete tanks. But it's very, very interesting to for the conservation of reserve wines. So uh, it's small capacity tank, so we can keep uh, villages, uh, varieties, years. Uh, so that's... Um, really very important for me to have these collections of wines. Um, and what is important also in Pomerie is we have two, two types of uh, reserve wines. You, have, um, you, keep, you keep the wine of a village uh, of a year. You can keep a, a Verzenay mm-hmm. 2012, for example. Uh, but we also keep the blend. Uh, so we always keep a part of Brut Royal, of Brut Apanage, of Brut Blanc de Blanc. Uh, because uh, in the 30% of the reserve wines, you have always 15% of the Brut Royal of the year before. Okay. We always keep 10 to 20% of the blend in mm-hmm. tanks to add in the, the blend of the year after. Uh, and it's only, it's a, of course a big investment in terms of uh, capacity of tanks, but it's really very important for the consistency for the the regularity, the regularity of the of the wine you have always um the blend uh um aging with the um, uh, every year oh that's so interesting yeah i don't think i've heard that before that you put um you know you have them all together and then you use them in the next year so that's that's a really yeah, cool yeah. concept so we, that, we... oh go ahead <laughs> No, so so yeah, it's really I think the signature of the company because we are doing this on all the all the non vintage non vintage cuvee okay. on the brut apanage on the blanc de blanc. Uh, um, yes, it's very important for for us. And so, when did that? When did you guys start doing that? Has that been going on for for quite some time, or through the whole history, or did someone introduce that? Um, I don't know if somebody <laughs> introduced that. I think we are doing this since. Uh, since a long time, because okay. uh, Thierry, Thierry Gasco has always do uh, work like this. I think the Prince and Polignac too. So that's why I think the, the Brut Royal is, is aging a little bit every year, and that's that's the idea. We are always keep we are always uh, um, a little part of the of a, a very old Brut Royal in, in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, what is the 
And let's talk, because I know like the blue means the royalty, like you said, uh, and I actually, actually visited Pomery last year and noticed I mean, she's always wearing blue and there was like the blue art exhibits and lots of blue throughout. So is that just um, because of the royalty or did she and did she just really love that color? Um, no, it's, it's, really, it's really linked to the royalty and uh, uh, we are because um, the, the Polignac were princes and so we are uh, all the cuvee have, uh, have a name of uh, linked to the royalty and the color is uh, really linked to the, to the blue, blue royal. Okay, that's great to know. Cause I, I wasn't sure about that. <laughs> so, do you use um, malolactic fermentation in the winemaking process? Um, uh, yeah. Yes, we. Doing? Yeah, it's it's really um, interesting because um, we are doing um, malolactic fermentation on one hundred percent of our wines. It's really okay. we we were um, one of the first company to. To manage the malolactic fermentation in the, in the 80s, where we did a lot of work in R and D on the malolactic, because for for us it's uh, something we have to uh, to to manage because um, it we we want 100 percent of of malolactic because it's really the style of the of the house. Uh, you know, when you you do not the malolactic, the wine is really different, and we we want to keep this creamy taste uh, in our wine so the the, the malolactic fermentation is important for for us and and we it's not um it's not a question of acidity for for us it's really a question of taste mm -hmm. uh we have other um tools to to play on acidity we can work on the pressing for example uh so we don't use the malolactic fermentation to to change acidity or to, to to play on acidity. What, what, what okay, to let's talk, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. No, I was going to ask for, you about for, the, the vineyard um, practices as well. I know we talked some about the winemaking and the, um, but how about your guys' vineyard practices? So uh, we are, um, uh, we, we are, uh, we have, some labels, uh, environmental labels. We are uh, in sustainable viticulture um, since uh, the beginning of the creation of this label in, in 2014. Uh, we were one of the first company to be uh, uh, certified uh, 14,001 uh, in the beginning of the 2000s. So mm -hmm. we are really committed to environment and the, the vineyard is really uh, uh, Pushing on, on, on all these aspects, uh, very important for for me uh, mm -hmm. personally. Uh, that's why we we um, we just uh, uh, we just took a, a turn uh, for the harvest 2020 because we are moving to organic production. Uh, so we we will have all the, all the labels of sustainable viticulture, and we are in three years we. We, we aim to, to be organic too. So okay. that's really a, a full package now we, yeah, we want to. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a group philosophy. I think you, you, you talk to, to Bruno uh, Maya from the, from the Camag region from, um, for Pink Flamingo Chateau La Gordon. And uh, I think we are, we are one of the, the biggest uh, vineyards in France uh, in organic production. Uh, so that's really uh, a global philosophy for the company to be organic in all of our vineyards. So yes, uh, that's really uh, Mr. Vanken is. Uh, it's not a commercial choice, you know. You know, it's uh, really a philosophy of uh, of the owner, and all our vineyards will be organic in, uh, in in less than five years. I think we are in line. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's great. That's a great initiative. I'm sure that's a big project, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a big project. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so you mentioned the 2020 harvest. So how was the harvest overall? I heard it was one of the earliest harvests in Champagne. Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, 
uh, difficult because uh, you know we we had uh, a little virus in the world this year. Uh, the COVID was uh, very difficult to 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 manage in France uh, as in the US, I think. But uh, and it's it was really difficult because of this early harvest too, um, because we didn't have so much time to to prepare this harvest. And uh, with uh, the difficulty of the COVID, it was uh, it was really uh, a tough year because um, you know the. The wine growers can't can't just stop and stay at home. Uh, I think a lot of workers in France stay, stay at home during two months, three months for the the protection. But all all uh, my wine growers, uh, the workers, had to be in the vineyard because uh, the, the the vines uh, didn't stop. So it was very difficult to work with uh, this uh, COVID climate. Um, but uh, the harvest is um, pretty good, so that's the good news. Uh, the year was very difficult for the sales, for everything, but um, the the vineyard the vineyard were uh, very safe all the year, and uh, the grapes were uh, very good at the harvest. Uh, it was a bit difficult to manage because uh, it was the earliest year in the history. Uh, we started on the third, I think, on the 13th or 14th of August, so it's, oh, wow. uh, it's, That's really crazy. Early. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh -huh. um, but I think it was really a, a harvest for wine growers. Uh, that's to say, um, some vineyard was very right, but uh, some others uh, needed a long time. Um, and I think in the history of Pomri, we have always been the the ones uh, waiting for the good ripeness. And this year, you, you had to wait because um, it's not only a question of sugar. It's mm -hmm. also a question of taste, of aromas, and you have sometimes to, to wait a bit. And I think we, we did the good choice with, uh, with the team. And we, we delayed a bit uh, the harvest in some villages. And I think it was a good, uh, a good solution because... So the wines um, are tasting very good this year and uh, very interesting for the blend in a, in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's exciting. So in a few weeks, you'll, you'll start doing the blending process or figuring it out. Not, not the blending because um, we, we have two stages of blending. We are making what we call pre-blending. Okay. We, we start to gather some things together. Um, uh, what we think can go in the Brut Royal, what we think can go in the Apanage or uh, the one or two tanks for the Cuvée Louise, we, we start to gather. It's the first gathering of tanks mm -hmm. and we'll do the, the blends more in February or March when we have a better vision of the potential of the wine because it's, it's too early now to, 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 to know exactly how the, the wines are, um, the potential of the wine. So, you can have some feeling, but it's not the, the fina final decision. Okay. And then how long was the harvest period? Is it like a few weeks or um, do you have to stop by a certain date or can you kind of continue until you... It's usually short in Champagne and very dense. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, uh, on, on the village, it's around 10 days. And okay. from the first village to the last one, it's three weeks. Uh, most of the time is three weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's not okay. so so long because in other regions you can have a harvest for one month, month and a half. Yeah, yeah for more. Uh, but in Champagne, we have only three varieties. They are uh, quite uh, similar in terms of, of ripeness. So uh, it's only the, the villages, the slopes, the exposure that can delay from one week to weeks. But uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, short and, and very, very hard and very quick because... It's only by end, as you know, it's only by end. So it's a lot of pickers uh, on a short period. Uh, for us, it's more than 600 pickers. Uh, so it's a very big team to manage every, every day, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the most important things about the book? I haven't had this one before. I'm excited. <laughs> Come back to the Brut Royal. 
um, it's really a wine for aperitif. Okay. And what is important is um, you, you, the idea is to have the, um, the aromas of each variety, but without really know what is the proportion of each variety. We, we really want the harmony between the three varieties and the kind of synergy between the three varieties. You have white flowers, you have... Oh, Clement, I think I'm losing you. You're cutting out a little. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I think you cut out for a second, but I think you're coming back. Yeah, I'm here. Can you, you hear me? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, we Sorry. Can, but we missed that last part. <laughs> yes. So in the mouth, in the mouth, you are really, really, um, um, the attack is very uh, straight. And the idea is to have a... Um, a I think we lost you again. Are you guys able to hear Clement? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, okay. Okay, sorry. It's okay? No, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, I was saying that for the Good Royale, the idea is to have um, a really uh, a curve of testing without any holes. It's really a curve uh, like this crescendo to have a, a very a, a, a very strong finish and uh, with this, this uh, aroma of citrus fruit at the end to, to just have the, uh, the envy to take another glass. So, uh, okay. Blanc de Blanc. Apanage Blanc de Blanc. The same one. So, um, apanage, um, you can see apanage on the, on the muselet. Uh, so apanage is a link to the royalty also because, uh, the apanage in French is the privilege of the king. Um, and, um, so the apanage in the royalty is, uh, the gift of the king to the second son. The first son has uh, the kingdom. Uh -huh. uh, the kingdom, so, so the Brut Royal, uh, is like a, a kingdom, and the second son has the apanage. So the apanage was a very nice gift for the second son to avoid any trouble with the first one. So, uh, <laughs> in the same spirit, uh, the, the apanage is a very confidential world, uh, with, uh, a very rich potential. So, uh, apanage is uh, the range dedicated to gastronomy. It's really the wines for gastronomy. So we have a brut, non-vintage, we have a blanc de blanc, and we are launching the blanc de noir uh, this year. Oh, wow. uh, so okay. The blanc de blanc was launched in 2017, what was my, my first cuvee as chef de cave. Uh, oh, so uh, very, imp very important for me. Yeah. Well, so blanc de, uh, you, you had 40 villages on the, on, on the Brut Royal, on the, on the Blanc de Blanc, it's a very small selection of villages. It's 10 villages. Uh, and it's uh, a combination of four terroirs. Uh, because I, uh, I have a strong link with the vineyard and the terroir. The idea on this cuvee was really to, to make a wine uh, based on terroir, on, on choky terroir. So you have a base of Côte des Blancs, of course. You have some Chardonnay of the Côte des Blancs. But the main part of the wine is is uh, from the Montagne de Reims. Okay. The Montagne de Reims, uh, which is more famous for the Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. A lot of Grand Cru of Pinot Noir. But in this Grand Cru of Pinot Noir, you have very interesting Chardonnay. So the idea in this wine is to find the good Chardonnay of this uh, Grand Cru. Mm -hmm. uh, to have a Blanc de Blanc, maybe different from the others. The Blanc de Blanc is very trendy at this time, so I think. So the idea in this wine is to have a nose of Blanc de Blanc, 
but uh, in the testing in the math to have uh, more structure area to make a blanc de blanc for gastronomy. Okay. I'm excited to taste it. So what, um, I guess what uh, villages from the Montaigne de Rems do you guys usually get the Chardonnay from? Or does it so, um, We start from, from Villers Marmery and uh, we, we, um, we are using Chardonnay from Verzonnay, Verzi, Sillery. Really, it's uh, from Villa Marmery to Sillery. We have uh, different, different uh, Chardonnay from these villages. The two other terroir are um, Nogent la Besse. It's uh, maybe not so famous slope, but it's very interesting. It's uh, we are we are purchasing and and um, managing vineyard in this slope since a long time, and it's very uh, interesting in the blend. Uh, it gives you the, um, the fruits, the exotic fruits uh, you can find in, in, in this wine. And, and the other terroir is the Clos Pompadour. I don't know if you know that we have a, a very important vineyard around the castle here in Reims. Uh, we have 25 hectares of uh, Clos. A Clos is a vineyard surrounded by walls. Mm -hmm. So we have a vineyard just, uh, just uh, behind me. Uh, 25 okay. hectares, and we are making a, a cuvee called Clos Pompadour. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, we are we are using also these grapes in s different cuvees. And a part of uh, the Chardonnay of the Clos Pompadour are going uh, into Blanc de Blanc, also. Okay, great. Yeah. So the so, Clos Pompadour uh, is that all all the grapes, or just Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, or is it all three? Or? It's, it's mainly mainly Chardonnay, but you have also oh. a little part of Pinot Noir and Meunier. So the, the blend of the of the Clos Papalo is uh, seventy five percent of Chardonnay, twenty of Pinot Noir, and five of Meunier. So it's mainly Chardonnay, but you have also some uh, Pinot and Meunier. No, this is so really nice. The... It has like a little more body, I think, and then I'm getting a lot of like grapefruit and citrus and some floral. Yeah, on the nose, I think you are, you are more on the. On the floral, floral uh, world, you know, it's uh, uh, maybe linden, uh, jasmine, some acacia, honey. Mm -hmm. And in the mouth, of course, you have m more structure uh, and, uh, and very ripe citrus fruits. Yes. But what is interesting too is um, uh, I really love to, to speak about the texture of our wine. We have really a silky texture in the wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's linked to the terroir and the and the choky terroir. You have really the, the feeling of uh, of the ch chokiness in you the, the mouth. I kind of feel it like right around here. Yeah, yeah. And and the finish, you have a a kind of bitterness. So it's not um, for me, it's not a problem to have a little bit of bitterness because it's when you have uh, so much minerality in the wine, uh, it's normal to have uh, what I call a noble bitterness at the end. So it's very delicate bitterness. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, like uh, ripe citrus fruit bitterness, you know, uh, like a uh, uh, um, grapefruit, but very, very ripe grapefruit. Yeah, I'm definitely picking up on that grapefruit. It's nice. So you said that this was um, because of um, the gastronomy. So can you like explain more about creating gastronomic wines and um, I guess pairings that you would enjoy with this one? Uh, I'm, what I like to do with this wine is, of course, fish, because I think it's really a wine for, for doing things with fish, and especially if, if you like Japanese food, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very interesting to, to pair with Japanese food, uh, uh, sushis and, and sashimis. I uh, really like to, to do this, uh, because even if you, you add some spices, uh, the wine is um, strong enough to... To, to be paired with spices, so it's very interesting. So, uh, yeah, it's really something I like to do, carpaccio, fish carpaccios, or, mm -hmm. or Japanese food is very interesting, yeah. On this one, we are... Yeah, it's very nice. I could, I could picture it with some nice carpaccio. That sounds perfect. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> a, a sea brim carpaccio, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do, uh, it looks like we have a... Oh, go ahead. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, on, on this wine, we are using less reserve wine because the idea on this wine was to, 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 to keep the freshness of a Blanc de Blanc. So we are using only 15% of reserve wines. Okay. Uh, but, but the particularity of, of this reserve wines 
is that we are using maybe the best tanks we have in the company. Uh, so we are using less uh, with our wines, but maybe the best. Okay. It's really like, you know, like spices you can use uh, mm -hmm. and you, it's really uh, um, a powder of, uh, of spices. And uh, for the first one, we used a, a very old um, tank. It was the Cremant 95 well, that we used for the Cuvée Louise 95. So it, it was only 1% of the blend, but uh, okay. it's just you to imagine the quality of the reservoir we, we can use in this blend. So it's a small quantity of reservoir wine, but very powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, people are always communicating on the percentage of reservoir wine, but you know, if you are using only wines from one year, it's not the same. Uh, you can use 50% of reservoir wine, but it's only from the year before. It's not the same. Yeah. And using a 95 or, or something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, more than the, the percentage, the, the quality uh, of the reservoir wine is very important. Definitely. Yeah, this is a really great Blanc de Blanc. Um, I'm really loving the, like that grapefruit, like you said. It's, it's really nice, <laughs> especially because it's really early over here. So it feels like it's my... <laughs> This is my morning breakfast. <laughs> Some for me, it's a, for me, it's a good, a good time. For me, it's a good time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like we have a couple questions. So I'm going to see what those were. And then if anyone has any questions, feel free to either ask in the chat or um, through here. So someone's asking, what's the best vintage that's still available? Um, <laughs> or or a recommendation all, on what vintage is all, all, all the vintages are available in, in the Vinotech. Mm -hmm. um, with, um, with the current vintage we are selling um, uh, 2004 for the Cuvée Louise. Okay. 2008 for the, the vintage. Mm -hmm. um, we are also um, selling some 2003 Magnum on Cuvée Louise. Uh, but uh, on the Vinotech, you can have um, almost all the, the vintages of Cuvée Louise since um, 1979. So it's, it was interesting wines from 89, for example, uh, or 96. Uh, 90, of course, it's amazing. And, um, and uh, I think for, for me, uh, the best vintages of the last 30 years are maybe um, 85, uh, 90, uh, 2002. I think uh, it's okay. really the three, three vintages we can uh, we can keep an eye on it. <laughs> and, uh, and and for Cuvée Louise, uh, I have maybe uh, um, uh, some uh, uh, emotion with the 1980 because it's my my birth year <laughs> and it's um it's not um, a very famous vintage in champagne but uh, on on cuvee louise it was really a success so 1980 on uh, in magnum on cuvee louise it's uh, very interesting that's nice you always have your birthday bubbles to celebrate with yeah. <laughs> and then another question um was about the the little pop bottles um uh, if people can Customize them, or do you have to be like a big company to get customized bottles? But there is, a, I don't have the minimum volumes uh, okay. here with me. It depends on the sales director, of course. But um, uh, from from a, a certain quantity, you can personalize your your uh, your your quarter. Uh, it's very used in the B two B B two C uh, market because uh, some companies are using it to 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 brand. Uh, the, the pop uh, it's uh, it's very interesting i think yeah yeah no it's great and they're really and they're really fun <laughs> yeah. and then one other question have, was have, um, have, okay. excuse me we have also we have also pops for the baby showers you know we have a pop for it's a boy and it's a girl we have the pop okay. uh, yeah i saw those <laughs> I think was, uh, yeah on the website to buy so yeah, uh, yeah. those were really cute <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question was, how much of your production is coming to the United States? Is it, a, are we like a big um, buyer or is it more 
I guess what are your biggest yeah, markets? Yeah. <laughs> It's one of the biggest market, of course, um, because uh, you know it's the first market for champagne, uh, not in volume but in 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 value. So it's a very important market. So for for us too, and especially on Pomeroy. So uh, of course, it's uh, it's not enough, <laughs> and especially at this time. But uh, it's a very very important market for for us, especially um, in California. Uh, New York, California, and Florida, it's uh, maybe the states where, where we are selling the most. But uh, uh, yes, it's a very important market for us. And then I, I also wanted to, since we're talking about the Americas, the, I have this because I visited, but the big, um, the ton with like the wood um, and the engraving and the art. Can we talk about, I guess, the association with the house and the art? Yeah, we we are um, housing every year uh, an exhibition on uh, contemporary art uh, because uh, the, the company has a, a very strong link with art since uh, since Madame Pomery, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know she uh, she was a strong woman, and when she had difficulties, uh, at one point some people were say, were saying that uh, she she had. Um, Difficulties and uh, that she she was she was about to sell the company and uh, so she decided to 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 buy a very expensive uh, painting uh, and to give the painting to a museum in Paris uh, that was a tableau called Les Glaneuses from Millet and so that was a way to show that she she had she was strong enough she had money and that uh, and, and and so. Uh, that was the start of the link with art, and and the director of Pomery uh, from the time of uh, of Panam Pomery was a very big collectioner of art, um, Henri Vanier. Uh, so and uh, with the Vranken family since uh, the beginning uh, in 2002, uh, every year we have uh, an exhibition of contemporary art. It changes every year. Okay. Uh, that's why every visit in Pomery is different. If you are Coming back to Pomerie this year, it, it will be different. It's another, we call this Experience Pomerie because it's really uh, an, a different experience every year. Uh, and the sellers are different every year. And that's, that's really uh, uh, a new world every year, that, uh, depending on the artist. Yeah, no, it's, it's an amazing experience just walking through all the sellers and seeing all the cool exhibitions that are in there. It's very... I feel yeah. like you are in a, a piece of history and then an art museum at the same time. So it's yeah, but, that but uh, the opposition between the, the traditional sellers and the, mm -hmm. the, the bas relief uh, in the chalk and the, the modern art uh, everywhere. Yeah, no, it's really cool. It was a great experience to, to see. And I definitely recommend it when, we, when people are able to travel there again to, to definitely visit um, the sellers because yeah. it's incredible. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We especially um, excuse me. Yeah, we are we are still open. So especially this time, you don't hesitate if you can. I know it's very difficult to travel. So, uh, but um, uh, if you have the opportunities, I I, I hope in the, a few months it will be over with this uh, virus. But uh, we are really waiting for for people to come because. Um, you don't drink Pomery uh, the same when you have visited the estate or not, because it's to understand the, the wine and the philosophy. It's it's really important to to see um, to see the estate and to to feel the atmosphere uh, here in uh, in Reims. Yeah, no, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, I definitely recommend everyone to visit. Even the architecture, like out before you even get in, is incredible. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Seeing that and then the whole experience is is phenomenal. So I definitely recommend everybody to go, especially the chalk uh, queries, because you don't see that at every champagne house. So no, of course not. I also wanted to um, go over because we've tasted two of your styles, so maybe if we go over um, kind of briefly. Um, other styles you produce, and if you have a favorite one you you work on, or um, just give some information, more information about um, the champagne you guys are are producing, and that's available. So we are. I think uh, every year I, uh, I am doing between fifteen and twenty blends, different blends. Okay. So we have a, a wide range uh, from the, the brut royal, the brut rosé, of course. Uh, we have the apanage range. 
So you, we test it today as blanc de blanc, but we have a non vintage and a blanc, a blanc de noir, an apanage rosé too. So that's really for the gastronomy. We have all the, the pop, the pop range. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a vintage for the pop. We have a non vintage. So it's really, uh, uh, a particular world in Pomeritz, uh, the, the funny world of, uh, of pop. Uh, we have, um, of course, uh, the, um, the new cuvee, uh, which is, uh, to be drink on, on ice. So, uh, in big glasses with ice, it's called Royal Blue Sky. So it's a blue sky oh. bottle. Uh, so it's a, a demi sec. Uh, so it's really for the, the new, uh, customers. Uh, to be drink around the pool, uh, with, with, uh, with ice. So it's, uh, really tr the trendy QV. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have also, um, the vintage. So of course, uh, uh it's only made by, uh, by Grand Cru. So mm -hmm. it used to be the prestige QV of Pomeris in the 19th century. So the, the vintage QV. And of course, we have the prestige QV, uh, called the QV Louise. As you know, uh, it has been created in '79 to pay homage to the to to, to Madame Pomery. It's the name of the daughter of Madame Pomery. Um, and uh, we have three different cuvée Louise. We have uh, the, right. the classical one, and we have uh, a rosé cuvée Louise rosé also. And we have um, uh, we we launched very recently a cuvée Louise nature. Uh, oh, wow. Nature, yeah, without dosage. Mm -hmm. uh, but nature in Cuvée Louise is, uh, of course, it's no sugar, but it's, it's also a way to tell that it's, uh, we, we, we propose you Cuvée Louise without any artifice, uh, only terroir for terroir, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's um, the French meaning of nature. It's also the link to the nature and to the, to the nature and mm -hmm. to the, the terroir. And what was the first vintage for that one? Um, 2004. 2004. Okay. Yeah. Because 2004 was a very, a very interesting vintage uh, with a lot of maturity. And uh, we, we thought it was the time to propose the two dosages. So the classical one, it's an extra brut. It's only uh, five grams of sugar. So it's a very small quantity. But uh, it's different from the nature without sugar. So... It's interesting. It's the same blend, exactly the same wine, but only the, the, the dosage is uh, changed. Mm -hmm. So it's a wine for connoisseurs and you can make uh, experiences of pairings with the two wines and you can make uh, very interesting pairings. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And so the 2004 is the current vintage that's released. Um, so yeah. obviously you have a very long aging on, on the Cuvée Louise, which is yeah, but, great. But, but, but a lot so, of people... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So that's a particularity, I think, of the house. We we have always uh, delayed uh, grading over the houses. Uh, we are selling 2008 for the the vintage, 2004 for the Cuvée Louise, okay. uh, because we are, we are working only on Grand Cru, uh, and we need a long time to 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 express to express the potential of our, of our wine. Our cellar, as you know, are very cold. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 40 meters below Earth, so it's the aging is very slow. So Grand Cru and very slow aging, you need a long time to express the potential. Mm -hmm. And when you test Pomerie, you and all vintages of Pomerie, uh, the first thing you, yeah, you, you, the first reaction is the freshness of the wine. So that's really the signature of Pomerie. Uh, the, the wine of Pomerie have w uh, not one life, but a long, a long, uh, a lot of lives, different lives, uh, second life, third life, because uh, they are aging very slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great for collectors, for sure. Um, yeah. And if you guys can get your hands on those 2004 vintages, I'm sure they're, they're excellent, especially that comparison. That's really fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, ask. Someone says the vintage reminds me of being transported to France. It creates a memory. So definitely good feelings when drinking champagne pomery. <laughs> I've seen a lot yeah. of great comments coming through <laughs> while we've been speaking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
We have like a little more time. So do you want to briefly, because I just recently also tried your California sparkling and I heard you guys are also going to have English sparkling yeah. wine. So maybe yeah, we can, we, of... we, can, we can talk about uh, Louis Pommery. Um, it's a very recent project. Um, uh, we started the project in uh, 2015. Uh, quite at the same time between England and California. Uh, we, we, the idea was to pay homage to Louis Pomery. Louis Pomery um, was Mr. Pomery, the, the founder of the company, and he died two years after the foundation. So nobody knows, to be honest, nobody knows Mr. Pomery. Everybody knows uh, the widow Pomery. Uh, so the idea was... Uh, uh, bling to, 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 to Mr. Pomery and uh, so the sparkling wine of the company uh, are branded as uh, Louis Pomery in, in England and in California. Uh, the, the, our, adve our adventure in California started in the 70s because Pomery uh, bought some vineyard in, in the 70s but for, as I told you at the beginning, the 80s and 90s was a difficult time for Pomery with a lot of, of um, of change in the ownership, so um, we we stopped the, the adventure in California, and uh, and the overall company of Champagne uh, 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 keep going, and so we we are we are a bit late in California, so that's why in 2015 we we decided to to come back in California, mm -hmm. and to to imagine uh, our, our new sparkling wine of California, so the idea is really to work on on the Chardonnay. Uh, and to 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 propose a, a wine really based on Chardonnay and to make, um, as we do in Champagne, a blend of a different region of California. Um, uh, so it's a it's a blend of um, of Sonoma and Napa and also a part mm -hmm. of Lodi. So the idea is really to find a different expression of the Chardonnay and to to as we do in Champagne for the or Blanc de Blanc to really make blend of a different expression of the of the chardonnay and to express the potential of the of the region the idea is not to make champagne it's really to make a californian sparkling wine uh we have our know-how we have our uh, the pomery style in terms of of um, looking for the finesse uh looking for for the right blend but we the first goal is to express the potential of the terroir of California, and we are doing the same in in uh, in England. We we have uh, planted uh, a large vineyard in in Hampshire in in England, uh, more than forty hectares, okay. and uh, the idea is the same. That exp the expression of the terroir in England, uh, of course, with all style, but it's not. Uh, it's not the question of making a champagne in, in England. It's really to make an English sparkling wine uh, because we, we don't want to make champagne in, in England. But I think there, there is a, um, a strong potential uh, uh, in England for sparkling wine uh, with uh, their own identity. We don't want to copy champagne. We can do very good with their, their own identity. Of course, in California, we already know that uh, there is a big potential for sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do have a question because I know we're going to be ending since someone's asking where they can find Pomery in the UK. Uh, you can you can find Pomery, I think, in all the the good the good liquor stores. Um, you can find more on on, on liquor stores. Uh, uh, like, um, I think quite everywhere uh, in good liquor store. I don't have the, the name of all the chains we are working uh, with, but um, I think you can find, especially in California, it's not too difficult to find, I think. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've answered all the current questions. If you guys have any that we haven't answered, feel free, we have like two, I think we only have a minute left. Um, yeah. But it's been great to speak to you today, Clement, and for, to learn yeah, from you good. about Champagne Pomery. This has been really informative and a great session. Yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you, and uh, it's always a pleasure to speak about uh, the company. It's, uh, it's a difficult time with the uh, with the COVID, and we difficult for me to travel and difficult for for me to to receive people here in Reims. So it's a good way to kind of uh, share something and and to speak about Pomerie uh, 
virtually. <laughs> yes, no, it was lovely to have you. And thanks for taking time out of your day to speak to all of us. I think we've all learned a lot about the house. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, so yeah, someone's saying it is available on Drizzly for the US. So yes, it is available there. And I actually have a link in my bio to go there for you guys um, as well, for those who, who don't see it. But um, thank you guys again, and thank you, Clement. This was a wonderful session today. And cheers, tomorrow's Global Champagne Day, so you guys should go out and buy a bottle of Pomery to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> cheers. 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 <laughs> and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.